Welcome, Jeff. Hello, Mark. Thanks for being here. I, I anticipate we'll have a few more people joining us shortly, but we'll get started on time. And okay. um, I know, I know, Jeff, do you have any announcement or shall I just go into what I have to say? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to begin our mastermind today. Thank you for being here. Um, I realize everybody's very busy and that we've got five business days left before the end of March when many renters are going to be leaving when their lease expires. And then probably another two weeks or so before those that are trying to get their homestead exemption criteria met when they'll start leaving. So it's crunch time here. Um, and many of us are, are, are wondering what's gonna happen with inventory. So I just wanted to begin by saying at the moment in the matrix, uh, Naples area MLS, we have 50 new construction properties or pre-construction properties on the market over $3 million. And that uh, seven of those are on Marco Island. And one of those is with Jacqueline I'm going to mispronounce her last name, Akio. Uh, Akio. Uh, that's at 31 Manor Terrace on Marco Island, listed for three million two twenty-five. And then there's a listing in Naples with Tina Morasco uh, at the Isles of Collier Preserve, and that one's listed for three million three twenty-five. And then outside of those fifty that I mentioned, there are six additional listings in Benita Springs, a total of. Six in Benita, seven on Marco, and 43 in Naples. And those are both, uh, and the ones in Naples are both a combination of um, single family homes as well as condominiums. So if, if you're, uh, hi, Roseman, thank you for joining us. If you're, if you're thinking about uh, getting more familiar with the luxury market, I would suggest that you pull that list up, do your search, and you'll see that there are some neighborhoods and some communities that have multiple listings, several listings in each of those that are on new construction. So um, in sort of alphabetical order, I'll, for those of you that are on the phone, and, and I'm not gonna share the list in, uh, on the screen, but you're welcome to look, on, look them up. The neighborhoods that I would be looking into and getting familiar with who are the builders, and who are the developers are Aqualane Shores, Barefoot Beach, Bayfront, Coquina Sands, Mangrove Bay, Mediterra, La Pearl in the Moorings, Nautilus, Naples. Uh, I believe Quattro at Naples Square may have sold out. Um, there are single family homes for sale in Old Naples, Park Shore, Pelican Bay, Pine Ridge, Port Royal, Quail West, Royal Harbor, Seagate, Talis Park, Treviso Bay, and Connors Vanderbilt Beach. The highest active listing at the moment in, in our MLS, and there may be others on that are in the Marco MLS that are not showing up in the Naples MLS. So any of those of you that are listening or listening to the recording of this, don't automatically assume that what you're seeing in the Naples MLS is everything. But there is a listing in Marco, I'm sorry, in, in Port Royal that's listed for 25595 That's the highest active listing for new construction or pre-construction. Now there are other listings for non-new construction that are in the MLS at higher prices. But if you have somebody who's looking for new construction, that's where we are as of today. Um, and then in, in Benita Springs, in Benita Bay, Omega, has several high-rise condominiums that are that three million and up price. And then there are three single family homes on Hickory Boulevard on the Gulf. I don't know whether they're on the Gulf side or the inland waterway side, um, but that was the extent of the new construction above three million in Benita Springs. So tight inventory again. Um, there may be shadow inventory of properties that builders have vacant lots that they can build on, but for whatever reason, they have not put those as uh, pre-construction or new construction in the MLS. Does anyone have any questions about that or any comments? Anyone seeing anything similar 
Do you have do you have anybody who's looking for new construction at the moment? And free, feel free at any point to unmute yourself if you do. Um, the next thing that I wanted to mention was don't automatically assume that every listing is in either of our MLSs. Um, and this may, may or may not pertain to luxury, but I had a client contact me and ask me about a property for sale, and it was not a for sale by owner. Uh, it was not, it was uh, in Zillow and also in realtor.com. And it was listed by a brokerage who is part of the MLS where Sebring, Florida is located. And sometimes we also see agents uh, or offices in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Boca Raton, that take listings that don't join our MLS and they're, they're out there. So your client is going, well, wait a minute, you, you, know, you told me you were sending me everything that was available and suddenly they're finding something that's not there. So whether you search realtor.com, whether you search Zillow, whether you go into MLS Advantage, which if you're not familiar with that, ask someone in, in your office about that, but there may be additional listings out there to meet one of your buyer's needs that is not in our MLS. Anybody have any similar experience with that? You, Mark, there's another area that I think everybody should be willing to take a look at, and that is back on market. So in your MLS, when you log in right in the center, there's a little um, widget and the widget allows you to select what's happening in the last seven days. And, you know, it's interesting in the last seven days, uh, 23 properties over a million dollars have gone back on the market. So it's not a bad idea. You can hone that down into Naples or into a particular area. But if you have a customer looking in a particular area, it's not a bad idea to look at that stat uh, once in a while and see what's happened in the last seven days. There's quite a few properties that are you know, several of these four days, nine days, eight days, six days, five days. So a lot of these properties are being bid on and the bid is one. And then all of a sudden, either they find something they don't like about the property immediately, or they actually find another property that they like. So that's an area that is fairly new to us to see uh, in, in one week, um, 176 properties. Uh, come back on the market and, uh, and 100, 802 listed. So, you know, you really kind of got to add that 176 to the new listings to give you the idea what the true inventory picture is. The same. That's, that's very helpful information. And uh, anecdotally, I've heard the same thing from other agents is that they're finding that buyers are making offers on several properties as is and tying up more than one property. And then they they may have a 15 day inspection period. And on the 14th or the 15th day, they let one or more of them go and they keep racking up more pending sales and, and looking for something better. So be uh, aware of that, that that could be a consideration. Um, didn't, you have one, didn't you have one down on Marco Island that was on and off the market like three or four times and you called and said, you know, what's wrong with it? Yeah. And, that, and, and that's, you know, also ultimately uh, buyers were able to purchase something, but um, I've also had recently uh, a transaction where a property went under contract and one would have assumed just to move on. And as Jeff said, the buyer backed out, the, not my buyer, but another buyer for, for the property that my client was interested in backed out and came back on the market. And I was had a presence of mind enough to reach out to the listing agent when it went under contract. And I said, if for any reason it comes back on the market, would you please let me know? And also, do you have any other listings that are coming up in, in that particular development? And if so, would you please let me know when you do? And that's how we got an, the next one under contract. It wasn't the same property, but it was another one. And it was because I reached out to the listing agent and who, who sells quite a bit in that development and asked, please keep me in mind if you hear of anything that's going to be coming up on the market. So in a tight inventory, 
um, you're, if you're working on behalf of your buyer, you need to, to pull out all the stops to find available properties. Is anybody in the group um, using the golden letter so far with success? And if you're not familiar with the golden letter, you can just go online and, and type in what's the golden letter.com. Uh, James Shaw talks about it in the pivot shift ahead call frequently, and there's uh, recordings about it. And this is a letter that you send to property owners asking them if they would consider selling their home, that you have a, you have a particular buyer who's looking for a home like theirs. Uh, you could also uh, use it to, for your sphere of influence or your database and saying, we, we're working with buyers who are looking for homes like yours. Have you thought about selling? So the, a, a number of things, but again, it, in, whether it's luxury or, or the traditional market, there is a demand out there still for properties and when, when you tell a buyer there are, there's one property that meets your criteria or three properties that meet your criteria, they kind of look at you as if, are you really doing your job? Is that all there really is? And then you find out, well, either there's something that you weren't aware of. So you might even consider signing up with, a, with, a, with another email address for a Zillow account or a realtor.com account and get the notifications that your clients are getting from those two. So you may be using auto, auto emails within Matrix or within the Marco Island MLS to get, notify you when new listings come on the market or when their price changes, a uh, change in status. However, you're, there, there are for sale by owners that, that do appear on Zillow that you're not gonna see in the MLS. And so if you're signed up with Zillow, to with certain specific criteria. Maybe you create an email address for each of your clients. You know, I, this is Jones Buyer Naples at gmail.com. And you start receiving emails specific just to that one client in that account. And so every time Zillow has a new listing, you're going to get the, that email in that account. Now you have to remember to go check it. You can't just sort of like set it up and, and ignore it. Um, you could use another you know, sort of a catch-all Gmail account, for example, and have several different reports coming into that account. But I think that's a way to demonstrate your value to your client that you're doing everything you possibly can. The other, the other thought is who are the quote unquote gatekeepers in a community? Is it the property manager? Is it the maintenance man in a, in a condominium building? Is it the front desk person? Is it the front gate person? Is it some sort of service pool cleaner? You name it. They catch wind of when somebody's thinking about selling their home. And if you've established a relationship with them, maybe it's the mail carrier. Maybe it's the trash collector. You know, they see for sale by owner signs when they're driving up and down the street. And while we can't compensate them for uh, real estate services, you could give them a small gift as a token of appreciation. It doesn't have to be tied to a, a particular property. You could just give them a gift card, a basket of cookies, something of that nature. Say, if you ever see something that comes on the market, please let me know because I've got buyers who are looking for something, and I and I and I'm or I'm looking to build my inventory of properties and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for people that are helping me find those properties before they hit the market. So um, does anyone have any particular buyer needs or listings that are coming on the market before we go into the next step? Um, I, don't have, I don't have a selling, um, but I have a buyer that's very specific they tell me you need um, something on the, you know, he doesn't want to go on over 1 million, but he wants something that's on a condominium that is, um, he wants a full service. Go tell me he doesn't intend to have a car over here in Naples, but I was looking on for him on the, um, the waterfront um, on, on Naples on 5th, but over there, I don't see nothing on, on this price range, but everything that is for me is more than what is, you know, so Naples Square. 
yeah, it's it's more than that. Yeah, but it's looking something like that. So full service that means it doesn't it, it doesn't intend to have any car over here. Um, is on this price range under under one million or up to one million. Okay, so um, for Doreen and Jeff have been in the market, and I, and, and I don't know about Andreas how long you've you've been in real estate. Um, what I would suggest is in in prior to these to the shortage of inventory is if I couldn't find what I was looking for, I'd go back to the expires and the terminated listings and the withdrawn listings in the past two years. And then I would start tracking down to see uh, not withdrawns, but terminated and expired listings. I would go back and see if there is someone who hasn't relisted their property that might still consider selling. Uh, the next step I would do is look at the pending and the closed sales in the past year and see, okay, what neighborhoods, developments, buildings, et cetera, have all the bells and whistles that my client's looking for in the price range, but there's not something currently on the market today. And then you're going to have to rattle the bushes. So it might be sending those golden letters. If let's say it's aqua in, um, in North Naples, that, that if that building had all the things that, that your client was looking for and has sold properties in the past year in that price range, and there's nothing on the market today, then I'd be reaching out to owners in that building. Now, if you've got a broad number of results, you've got 30 buildings that, eat, that, that, meet, that match that criteria, that's not probably a practical thing to do. Um, but you, again, by the process of elimination, you would know a certain number of those had already sold in the past year. It's unlikely that those are, are going to sell this year. But there are probably others that have, been on the, that have not been sold, and you can check again through the public tax records, that have not been sold in the past several years. And those people are probably more inclined to sell than someone who recently purchased a unit in a building or a development. Yeah. So it's a matter of being resourceful. Now, the question becomes, how much time are you going to invest in doing that? Is your client truly committed to making a purchase or are you spinning your wheels? But there could be a byproduct of it is that, that maybe what you unearth it, it doesn't meet your particular buyer's interest. Let's say, for example, you send a letter out to uh, unit owners in a high-rise condominium and you got an answer back from somebody who has a two bedroom in a den and your client is looking for a three bedrooms in a den. Well, there may be a, an opportunity to get a listing there and still uh, make, you, make some kind of return on the investment of your time and materials that you sent out. The question that I have is how do you capture someone's attention? How do you, how do you if, if you're con trying to contact them, let's say that you're, you're not making a phone call because they're on the do not call list and you're not sending them spam email um, because you don't know them. Um, you're not door knocking because it's a gated community or a high rise, you can't get through past the front desk, you can't get in the building. So how do you capture their attention? And that's one of the challenges that I'm looking at right now is if I send a form letter, it may, they may either A, not open it, or B, it, they may open it and standing over the trash can and throw it in the garbage immediately. So you have to get creative and try and think about what is it that would give them pause for a few moments to take a closer look. Years and years ago, when I first got involved in real estate, in the very, very beginning, there was a trainer who came to the Naples Board of Realtors. And the advice that that trainer gave was find an invitation or a, a greeting card envelope, something that is big, you know, bigger than a small three by five card, maybe like a five by seven greeting card size envelope. And then they said, if you make it, if you fold something up inside of it and you make it thick, it looks like it's an invitation. You hand letter it, you know, you put a nice postage stamp on it. They're more inclined to, to, to say, oh, what, who's this from? Then they are a, a number 10 envelope with your 
company name printed on the outside of it. And it looks like all the other junk mail that they get. So again, you have to get creative. If you're trying to, here, here's a school of thought, maybe some of you have some ideas about it. If you're trying to capture the attention of 30 homeowners or 30 unit owners in a condominium, and you can't send easily flowers to 30 condominium owners, the front desk person's gonna shoot you because it's, it's a lot of extra time on their part to get those flowers delivered to each unit. At the same time, you don't wanna deliver flowers to one unit owner and, and the word starts spreading around the building that you know this realtor sent me flowers and the others are wondering, well, why didn't my flowers come? Or, or you delivered flowers the next day for the, for the next owner and the next day for the next owner. And you know the word spreads faster than that. So you have to think about something that you can send that's not going to be a burden for the person who has to distribute the stuff. And so they get, my thought process again is to go back to the mail. What could you mail someone that they would take the time to open and not throw away? Any thoughts on that? If only we all had the answer to that, we'd all be <laughs> in a pretty good spot. Um, I did just get something in the mail that came from a realtor that was the typical bright colored whatever. And it came from a realtor that said, hey, I've got buyers in your community, you know, are you looking to list? I, what more can we do than that? Um, I mean, if, if you so, put together a small goodie bag or, or something, you know, it, it's not as big as flowers, but it's in a little package to 30 people in the complex, maybe you're going to catch an eye. So here's a thought. Is there a publication, a magazine, um, something of that nature that would easily fit in an envelope, uh, maybe a nine by 12 envelope. Um, could you print a either a high quality market report or statistics, charts, graphs, etc.? cetera? Uh, I'm not talking about something that you photocopy on the copier in black and white. It's got to, if you're talking about luxury, it's going to have to it's going to look, have to look like you are serious as well as committed, as well as quality. But could you put together some kind of market report? Is it on their particular building if there are enough units that are sold in the past year? Or is it their, their street, their development, their neighborhood? And to show them maybe days on market, list price to sale price ratio, um, information about, you know, would show the size of the property. Where I live, I get postcards that come in the mail that have market statistics. And I know that the agent didn't compile the data. It's compiled by a third party service. And that third party service puts their logo on it, puts their contact information, and they send it out on a market report. But they're consistent about that farming. They're, they're regularly sending out those postcards, just listed, just sold, uh, quarterly market reports. So if you want to dominate a particular building, development, neighborhood, street, whatever it is, then you've got to think about, am I, do I, number one, do you have the resources to do it? Do you have the time to do it? And do you have the money to do it? Because the postage is going to be involved. Ultimately, maybe you're going to get their email addresses. And so you won't have to mail it to everybody. Um, but not everyone opens every email that you send. So, you know, before you abandon using traditional mailing services, there may be a benefit to doing both. Um, and then people begin to recognize you as the expert. And there was a company um, called The Group, and I believe they were in Fort Collins, Colorado. Maybe Jeff recognizes the name. And years ago, they did a, they, they created what, what in essence was a fictitious realtor uh, or agent. And, and maybe it was a marketing company that they hired. And they sent out for, this is where we get the eight by eight program that you hear about in Keller Williams. 
So this agent, this so-called agent or whatever, had never sold any properties. And they sent out a mailing once a week for eight weeks of something, an item of value, a report, a postcard, whatever it happens is for eight weeks. And the marketing company did a survey of the, of the neighborhood where they were doing the mailing to. And they asked in the survey, who was the uh, preferred agent, the number one, whatever you want to call it. And they got the results. And then they started this eight by eight campaign. And after eight weeks, they conducted the survey again. It was a random survey, but of all the households that they mailed to, who do you think the number one agent was? It was the fictitious realtor that had been sending out for eight weeks. So it shows that with proper planning and effort that you can position yourself to take market share. Now, when you're choosing a farm area, whether it's luxury or not luxury, which in my mind, and, and Doreen and Jeff, you may have thoughts on this, is you wanna pick an area where there's a high enough turnover. You don't wanna pick a neighborhood where there's a one sale every three or four years. That's not gonna be enough to, to necessarily, I mean, there might be a, there might, you might say, well, there's a justification that there have been so few sales in there that there's likely going to be a sale, but I'd rather pick an area where there's turnover people move in and out. There's more likelihood that you're gonna get more listings there. Um, the second thing I'd be looking for is, is there an agent who has more than 20% of the market share? And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't farm that area, but take a look at that. If, there's, if you look at the sales over the past two years and you see it spread out that there's one agent that maybe had two, maybe three listings and everybody else had three or less listings, there's probably a pretty good chance that you can get into that neighborhood and make a dent and, and get some listings. However, if you see that of the 20 sales that took place in the past year, Agent X had 15 of them, that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge to do it. But I'm not going to say you can't get in there. If there's enough turnover and it justifies there may be, be, be people in there, and I may have said this on a previous call, there may be people in there that don't particularly care for that agent, or they don't want to be in competition with their neighbor. In other words, they know they're going to be selling at the same time as their neighbor, but they don't want to have divided interest on the listing agent's part. If the listing agent's got six other listings in there, in that particular community, yes, they're, they're getting listings. And if you take a look, Take a look and see how many times did that listing agent have both sides of the transaction versus they had the list side, but they didn't have, they didn't represent any of the buyers. And then take a look and see how many times did a listing sell in that neighborhood by another listing agent where the buyer's agent was that agent that dominated. And maybe, and maybe you'll just see, they'd only take listings. They don't work with buyers. Uh, so there's a, there may be an opportunity in there uh, for those kinds of people who say, you know, that agent's been around here for 20 years and they don't make any effort. They just throw it in the MLS and it sells on its own and they're looking for somebody who can do something different. Or that agent, and I'm not, you know, as NAR members in the Code of Ethics, we can't talk about an individual agent in a negative way. So I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is there may be agents in there that are either abrasive or they don't follow through or they're poor communicators or their negotiating skills are weak and they don't, they don't get top dollar for the listing. And so there may be sellers in those communities who say, I want somebody different. I might like somebody who's with Keller Williams who has 200,000 agents worldwide or associates worldwide and or close to and that they have leverage they have power to get my listing out in front of more people than perhaps the local boutique brokerage does. So Doreen, you, you came from, was it John R. Wood? Mm -hmm. Why would you share with us what you think the value proposition, the typical luxury agent and John R. Wood would talk about? Are they talking about themselves or are they talking about the company? Well, I think because John R. Wood has been a household name for so long in this area people that's definitely something they talk about um 
it is merely a boutique company. Um, it is, uh, when you talk about doing referrals in other parts of the country, they don't have that same ability that we have to have offices here, there, and everywhere, um, sales associates, realtors, whatever, everywhere, like we do. Um, I think the thing that you hear from them is, you know, we're local, but we're also global. You can't have it both ways. I guess you can, but, or you can make it appear that you do. Um, but we need to get the word out there that, yeah, the big selling piece is we have people everywhere. We know people everywhere. We are global. It's a big deal. So thank you, Doreen. Um, and it, so correct me if I'm, if I'm incorrect about this. John R. Wood, and, and, and when we talk about other companies, we're not disparaging other companies. They're all good companies. We're just trying to understand the distinction between one company and the next. So John R. Wood, if I'm not mistaken, is a part of the Christie's network. Is that right? They are a part of leading... Um, leaders in... Uh, leader, uh, leaders of... Luxury, luxury, luxury network. Yeah. So that, there are a lot that. of, so for, the, for those of you that don't know what I'm referring to is a lot of independent small brokerages around the country have banded together and formed a network for referrals and pr cross promotion. Um, what my uh, limited understanding is there are also agents at local brokerages like John R. Wood or Royal Shell, um, that their agents belong to networks that are either in luxury or, for example, the Certified Residential Specialists, um, the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing. So the distinction is, as Doreen sort of alluded to, is unless you're from this area or unless you visited this area, you probably have never heard of John R. Wood or Royal Shell that, that is mostly a locally known company. Why does that impact the seller? Well, the benefit could be that they have market share in a, in a neighborhood or a development or a history. They spend a lot of money on advertising. And so they get a lot of listings off of their name and their signs. What, but I, I used to teach a course on know your competition. And the idea was whatever your competition does, you have an answer for it. You have a counter response for it. I'm not saying a negative counter response. I'm just saying the benefit of working with my company is we're not, we're also active locally. We have people who are involved in leadership at the board of realtors. We have the best of the best in networking, but we also have a network of agents from around the world that we connect with. And when your property is listed with Keller Williams, it's going to be on websites for Keller Williams Associates around the country. So if somebody in Indiana is looking for a home in Florida and they go on to the agent that they know in Indiana's website, they're gonna see homes in Florida. Do you think that the agent in Indiana or the customer in Indiana is gonna see the local boutiques listings on another website? Maybe, maybe not, depends on which one they go on. So what I would suggest, uh, Roseman, you're on, uh, on some of the Zoom calls that I'm on in the morning, right? You're on pivot calls, okay? So when you begin to make connections with agents in other parts of the country, let's say, for example, you're going on a listing appointment in, I'll say, Old Naples. It's a $2 million listing. And you think that the, that the buyer who's gonna buy that property, could be a move up buyer from Naples, but it could also be somebody from Manhattan. And so you say, when you go on the listing appointment is I have a connection with Tom Smith in Manhattan. And, and Tom and I network together on a daily phone call on, on best marketing practices. And then, 
you have Tom's phone number in your data on your phone and you prearrange with Tom that if you call Tom during 11 to 12 today, Tom's gonna to be ready to take your call and say, when I have a referral for Naples, Florida, I'm gonna be contacting Roseman. And so that you, you have kind of like a, a reference of someone that is from the area where you think the buyer's coming from. And you say, you know, what does that mean to the seller? Is the seller want, let's say, let's change the, the city. Let's say it's, we're convinced that this is a buyer from London, England. We have agents in London. So you've, if you, if you prearrange with the agent in London to say, if I call you, and of course, remember it's six hours difference or five hours difference. But if you, if I call you and you see my caller ID number, will you take the call for me? I'm going on a $2 million listing appointment. And I'd like to be able to, to say that I have someone who works with Keller Williams in London that I, that I network with. So I would suggest that you establish those relationships and maybe you have somebody in California in Chicago, in Boston, New York, London, some people that, that, that you establish a relationship with. And remember, you have to come from contribution first. So before you start asking for someone else to do something for you, ask what you can do for them. And then they'll be more inclined to say, yes, I'd be happy to help you get that listing. And I've said previously on these calls, if you're going up for a listing uh, uh, at maybe a, at a point or in an area where you don't have much experience, find another agent in one of our offices and co-list with them. If, you don't, if you're not confident that you can get this slam dunk and, and be sure and get the listing, I'd, I'd sooner team up with Doreen and, and get half a loaf than to get no loaf at all. Yeah. And maybe, you know, there are others that are going to be listening to this call later on uh, that aren't on the call right at the moment. But team up with someone because the, the benefit to you is the next time you go on a listing, you're going to be able to sell. Oh, I just sold a listing three months ago for three million dollars. It's easier to go in and get the next listing when you've had something under your belt that you've actually closed than to, to, than to be all hypotheticals. That I, that I can sell this, but I don't have any track record at all to go on. Now, if you don't have any track record right now, you're gonna lean on the company's results. You know, that, that my office has sold homes in your neighborhood, or my office sold a home last month for $5 million. Um, and my partners and I, in, within our office, we work together to help each other sell their properties. So you're not only getting me, but you're also getting the strength of the 200 and some odd associates in the Naples office, and however many associates there are in the Marco Island office uh, that are backing me up. So, um, and then you could talk about your broker or your team leader, the people that, that are involved in supporting you in the transaction. Anybody wanna to add to that? Okay, um, the, ne the next thing that, I that I'll talk about is when you're, if you're going to be marketing for luxury properties, I sort of alluded to this earlier, are you using auto emails within the MLS? So let's say, for example, are you setting up something that says every time there's a listing in this neighborhood, this building, this geo area, beachfront, golf course community. I want to know every time a, a listing over $5 million comes on the market in Marco Island, Naples, Bonita Springs, uh, that has is maybe in a golf course community or a gated community, that's an opportunity to position yourself as an expert in the market. You can then, with permission, you have to have permission, first of all, you can then do a social media post, you could do a postcard, you could do a mailing, an email, a phone call, say, I just wanted to share with you this exceptional home. Now, if it's a listing that's, with, that's not yours, let's say it's within your office, you, you have to go to the listing agent and get permission to advertise that property. You don't have an automatic right 
to advertise another agent's listing without their permission. And some agents, and, and part of the reason for that is some agents have had, when they got the listing, they told the seller, I'm going to control all the marketing and advertising. But I don't want it as a listing agent to have somebody who's not familiar with the property suddenly sending out postcards and, and fielding phone calls and then sort of doing the hum, the hum, the hum. I don't know any answers to the questions. But if you've been to the property and you, you've studied it and you've talked to the listing agent, maybe you did an open house there or you're going to do an open house there, then I think the listing agent would be more inclined to have you help cross promote the property. Keep and Jeff, you can back me up on this. If you're going to be advertising or not advertising, if you're going to be sharing information about another brokerage's property, you have to be real clear that it's not listed with our brokerage. There's and, a there's a disclaimer language that you can get from the MLS, or I could get it, send it out to everybody that basically makes that very clear. Also, in the MLS, it there's a little thing saying available for target marketing. There's a little checkbox at the bottom that probably you never looked at before. <laughs> but if it's checked, yes. And I don't know why you wouldn't want somebody else to advertise your listing. If it's checked, yes, you know, you, you're pretty much free to use that with uh, attribution of the source of the data. Uh, if it's not checked, then you really need permission from that person to use the, any of that information in, in your advertising. And remember that photographers these days are copywriting their photographs. So simply because um, it's your own brokerage or the other agent gives you permission to advertise their listing, even if they're not with Keller Williams, is those photographs may be copyrighted and they may not have the authority to give you permission to uh, do a postcard mailing or something or post it on the internet. Um, you know... Um, add to that a little bit when you're taking a luxury listing and you're paying somebody top dollar to, to photograph your listing and make it look, you know, really exciting and, and quality, you need to find out from your photographer what the rights to those are. Many of those people will give you the rights only for the life of your listing. And if there's um, area photographs like the amenities and things, you know, it's really, you really need to make clear with them what you can and can't use. And if you're working in a particular area, let's say, especially if it's a, a tower and you want to work multiple properties in that tower, you don't want to have to pay for the amenity photographs every time you want to be able to have those. So really, you know, you take for granted that I'm paying Mark $350 to take my pictures. And the next thing I know, um, I try to advertise for the a new listing for the amenities and the photographer sends me a bill. So be careful with that. Um, more and more photographers are being more and more uh, exclusive about what you can do with those photographs once your listing expires, or if you want to use them on another media. So make sure you take a look at the agreement you have with your photographer. And you know if it's not what you want, that's not time to, to change it. Many of them will say, okay, you can use the amenity photographs, you know, all you want, but, you know, the photographs of the individual unit are mine. So just a suggestion. Thank you, Jeff. Um, another thought is you simply can't walk into a luxury listing uh, that someone else has and whip out your phone and start taking videos or taking photographs. you got to get permission from ostensibly from the owner because the owner is granting the listing broker the right to, to take photographs, but the owner never agreed that anybody could come into their $6 million home and start taking pictures with their, their family, uh, pictures on the, on the nightstand and their artwork on the walls and their expensive accessories and jewelry and et cetera, et cetera. So before, uh, before you start thinking about, well, I'm gonna go to open houses in Port Royal, and start taking pictures, you might be able to take some pictures on the outside. Again, I would ask the, the listing agent for permission, but I, would don't I don't think that they would allow you to take pictures on the inside of their listing if they're, if they're a serious agent. I think that what you can explore is, are there photographs 
publicly available of the inside of the house that you could provide a link. So for example, if a property was on realtor.com or Zillow or something or a magazine, if it was in uh, a, a design magazine, then you could provide a link from that photograph in an email, for example, or in a social media posting. So it's not a photograph that you've taken. It's a photograph that's publicly available that anybody can see. Am, am I correct on that, Jeff? Um, say that one more time. In, in other words, if you want to show a photograph of, say, the interior of a home, and it's publicly on a public website someplace, then provide the link from the public website in your email or et cetera. And again, you're going to say that it's not your listing, yeah. but don't go into somebody else's listing and take a photograph yeah. and share and it. Use it. It's, yeah, there's some pretty uh, significant privacy and copyright laws that you got to be careful of using any picture off the internet that's not you know, released is possible. There's a lot of people that have been, um, you know, some of these major photos, we'll, we'll look and see if their photos on your website or you're using their photo other than a private email, you can get into some litigation over that. So just when you don't, if you don't have a release, um, then it's really not a great idea to try to use the photo that's not yours. Okay. Sorry. Um, thank you. The, the other thing that goes along with that is if you're going to be farming a development, uh, maybe a golf course community, maybe a high rise, is do they have a public website with photographs, again, that you could share? Or would they give you permission to take photographs of their area? And if they don't have photographs already, they might appreciate if you have the authority to distribute those photographs, they might actually appreciate having good quality photographs of their club room, of their pool deck area, of their beach chairs or whatever it happens to be. But first I would begin by looking at to see, is there anything publicly available about that development or community or condominium? And then uh, seeing the quality of them uh, and then diplomatically approach the right people. And that might be the president of the association or it might be the property manager or building manager. Um, I wouldn't necessarily assume that you can go and take pictures of all those amenities and post them on a website without getting anger from the association that who gave you permission to take those photographs and publish them. But I think that you could build a win-win relationship with a building manager or a president of association to, to offer to take the pictures, to offer to share them, if, assuming you have the authority to do so and make them look like gold. And the photos were courtesy of Doreen Doyle, as an example. Um, there, there are agents who, in the early years, created websites for associations. So when we talk about farming, is there a neighborhood, let's say of 50 homes or less, that doesn't have a community website? Maybe they would welcome somebody to create one for them. You, might probably, you probably would want to pay a third party to create that website and maintain it, but there could be information about open houses. There could be information about um, events that are happening in communities. I don't, I don't know that in luxury communities we see uh, yard sales and things of that nature, so you have to be appropriate for the price range that you're talking about, um, but are there, uh, is there a link to information about the association documents. Uh, now, remember that needs to be something that's coming from the association, not from you. In other words, you're not gonna share association documents that are a year old that where they've been amended in the meantime. So they, they may wanna have some input on what you share on the website, but I think there's an opportunity there to build a farm and establish a deeper relationship so that when someone in that building or that development is thinking about selling, they think of you first because you're the one that's sending out the newsletters, the postcards, the emails, et cetera. You could get people to opt into the emails. And as long as it's relevant and useful information, 
most people won't turn it off and won't opt out if it's about recipes and St. Patrick's Day and a lot of other fluff, they're, they're, they probably get inundated with a lot of other garbage like that and they probably will unsubscribe. So I think, I think there are novel ways. The great thing is when you go into KW Connect, there are so many resources there on how to market yourself and how to farm. Um, it's like standing under Niagara Falls. There, there is so much information that you could glean. One of, the, one of the ones that I would encourage you to look up, whether it's uh, in KW Connect or whether you look on YouTube or Google, is look up Mike Hicks, H-I-C-K-S, and then look, along with Mike Hicks' name, look for, quote unquote, the promise. Watch Mike Hicks' video yeah. about the promise. And they're, to give it to you in a nutshell, they're basically doing an initial listing consultation or buyer consultation, and they're, they're promising to deliver five-star service. So if you're not prepared to deliver five-star service, never say that you're going to do five-star service if you're only going to give three-star service. But if you say you're going to give five-star service, then you want to repeatedly throughout the transaction ask, how are we doing? Are we meeting your needs? Is there something more that we could do for you? So that by the end of the transaction, Mike is expecting them, and he's told them this from the beginning, for recommendations and referrals from friends of theirs or people in their sphere of influence. So if it, again, you're gonna to have to deliver on the five-star service to get the results on it. And if you do that, that's mostly about 95% of their business is by repeat and referred clientele people who think that they gave exceptional service. What other questions do you, are you feeling at the moment or seeing in the luxury market that we could talk about before we end here in a few minutes? Anybody else who hasn't come on camera or unmuted, you're welcome to unmute now and happy to try and mastermind with you. I would. Are there, are there small communities, luxury communities that I have a, a large farm area now? And although I have sold several luxury pieces, I, I wouldn't say that I'm yeah. in the luxury. You're uh, not yet. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. Yes. You're not luxury. Um, you're just not there yet. I'm just not there yet. Um, in, is there. A, a small community, maybe this is something that, you know, we could talk about later, um, where, you know, you start small and you build, at least that's how I built my career, my, uh, my real estate career, it, trying to develop those relationships, because in my experience, real estate is nothing but relationship building, um, build those relationships, start um, with a small farm, and then grow from there. Um, I, I have a relationship with a bank, um, with an asset manager that um, every time there's, you know, a death or a move or whatever, I get the listings here, which is really very nice. I've built that relationship over the last five or six years. Um, so I've had the opportunity to sell the luxury, the high rises, but, you know, are there small communities out there that we could start with? There are, and what I would suggest is using the tools of the MLS to put a price range in a geographic zone or area you want to focus on and, um, and, and see how many results you get. So um, as an example, um, Hemming, Hemming, is it Hemingway, uh, off, uh, which is in NA15? Um, kind of south of Solana Road is there's a pocket of, of single family homes back there. That may be too small for what you're talking about, but it's good for the, as an example. So if you search for sales that close sales, active pending, withdrawn, terminated, expired in the two to $4 million price range in Naples or NA15, 
you're likely to see that there have been some sales in that neighborhood. Um, you could also search by street address, uh, by street name. But uh, there again, you, you wanna take a look at how many homes are on, in the community, how many of them sell on a one or two year basis, and who has had the listings in there? What was their list price to sale price ratio? What was their days on market? And begin to, to evaluate, is this worth my time and effort? Okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, Mark, I, I, I didn't know whether you could do this or not, but I, I did the luxury market graphics for sales over a million for February. I sent them to your email because I'm not sure how to get them on the screen. If you, if you, I don't know, it might be too late to do it, but if you have a chance to open your email and put those up on your screen, if not, I'll, I'll certainly share them with everybody, but I, I- Yeah, I think we could post we, them for everyone's benefit in the Facebook yeah, groups. We kind of, um, we're gonna get that redone. Uh, Heather was looking at doing a redoing the graphics, but we haven't had a chance to get there. And the information's quite interesting, especially you know for the differences between Collier and Lee for sales over a million dollars. So I don't know whether you, can you open yeah, your email? You know, the, the, the interesting thing, I don't, may, Jeff and I may have touched on this individually, but having been in real estate 27 years here in Naples, I have to adjust my way of thinking now about what market values are, because the houses that used to be a million are now 2 million. I mean, the ones that were a million last year are now two. The ones that were two and a half are now five. So having up-to-date information about what's happening in the market, that's, that's the touch point. That is what uh, excites people in your sphere of influence when you can recite what's happening in the market. Now, they may not be in the $50 million price range, so you got to be careful about positioning yourself in the ultra luxury. It's good to know what's happening in the ultra luxury because they're going to ask you from time to time, what's the most expensive home that's sold? Where is it? And what was it new construction or was it was it a resale? Was it what was the was it lot value? What did you have a view, et cetera? But if you can if you can have some of those at the at the top of your fingertips, and if you're not good about retaining that information, if it's a, a little story or a little write-up that the, the highest priced home that sold in the past year in Naples was 50 million, you know, then they begin to think of you in a different light. They begin to think of you as somebody who has their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the luxury market. Be careful though, because there's a double-sized sword of that. If you start sending that to people who live in half million dollar homes, suddenly they think you don't work in the half million dollar <laughs> price range and they go and list with somebody else. So you've got to tailor your information. I wouldn't begin by doing that. I'd begin by talking about their neighborhood where they live, drill down very specific about, you know, if you're talking about autumn woods, homes under a million dollars, then I would tailor my information about where they live. And then gradually, as you get to know them, then have the conversation about other neighborhoods and other sales that have taken place in the market so that you show, well, I don't only work in Autumn Woods, but I also work in Pine Ridge, and I also work in Pelican Bay, and Pelican Marsh, and the Strand, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to narrow it so small that people think, oh, well, my friend lives in Naples Park that wants to sell, but I thought you only deal dealt with Autumn Woods. So be careful about how you position yourself. Well, we're at 259. Our next call is next Friday. We hope to have a, a guest speaker. We'll let you know, but please uh, feel free to ask anybody in the offices if you need help uh, in either getting a luxury listing or getting a closed sale in luxury. Thanks for coming and ha have a great weekend. Hey, thanks, Mark. Great job on the meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia, you can stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>